Hello everyone, welcome back to Cyanogenic Glycosides again, part 2. So before I discuss, I will go through the learning outcome once again. So far we have discussed the definition of cyanogenic glycoside, natural occurrence and the process of cyanogenesis and the significance of cyanogenic glycoside. So at the end of this lecture, you will be able to explain the botanical name, family name, uses, important part of important plant species containing cyanogenic glycosides. So first we will start with the example of amygdalene. So this is the structure of amygdalene. Amygdalene nothing but an example of cyanogenic glycoside having two sugars. And it is mainly found in bitter almond. The botanical name of bitter almond is Prunus dulcis. It is also found in the kernels of various other fruits. Okay, like apple seeds, we will uh, discuss the examples later. Like as I mentioned, the kernels, there is the nuclei of fruits like peach, apricot, okay, then cherries, palm, etc. It belongs to the family Rosaceae. Now, hydrolysis of amygdalene, okay, which takes place with the help of a mixture, uh, with the help of a an enzyme known as emulsin. The emulsin I would like to mention here is actually a term used for a mixture of two enzymes that is amygdalase and pronase which is responsible for the hydrolysis of amygdalene and it is present in the kernels of almond. So if you look at the structure amygdalene, first amygdalase causes the hydrolysis of one sugar which results in the formation of pronacine. The pronacine further hydrolysis by the enzyme prunase result in the formation of mandolonitrile. Mandolonitrile then undergo degradation to form ACN or release ACN and benzaldehyde. <coughs> now I would like to mention here is that this mandolonitrile okay, is of two type okay, uh, based on its configuration it can be of D mandolonitrile or uh, L mandolonitrile that means mainly in the con uh, related to the configuration of mandelic acid and since one of the product is benzaldehyde you can see here so amygdalene containing drugs are also classified under aldehyde glycosides <coughs> sometime in some textbook you may find uh, amygdalene as an example of aldehyde glycoside next example is wild cherry in wild cherry it is mainly the dried stem bark of Prunus serotina. Prunus serotina is the botanical name of wild cherry where the cyanogenic glycosides are mainly present at its bark. So this is the bark of the wild cherry plant. <coughs> Excuse me. It also belongs to the family processing. The plant is mainly indigenous to US and Canada. This plant was used by the Red Indians as a domestic medicine and it contains as I mentioned previously uh, there can be two varieties of mandelic acid so it contains D mandelonitrile glucoside mainly that is nothing but the prunacine it also contains emulsine the enzyme which is responsible for the uh, hydrolysis of mandelin so one of the enzyme is prunase okay which can uh, hydrolyze the prunacine it also contains beta methyl escalentin, which is a methyl ester of dihydroxycarmarine. What are carmarines? We will discuss in a separate chapter. So, it also contains to some extent L mandelic acid, P carmaric acid, trimethyl gallic acid. So, not only the cyanogenic glycoside, other than cyanogenic glycoside, it also contains the other phytoconstituents. And when you talk about the amount of ACN acid that is liberated from this plant, it has been observed that the inner part of the plant, okay, the inner part of the bark release more as compared to the outer part of the bark. If you look at the quantity, inner part of the bark which can release ACN up to 0.23 to 0.32 percent as compared to the outer bark which can release up to 0.03 percent. And it is mainly used as a syrup, flavoring agent and sedative expectorant. 
Another example of plant containing cyanogenic glycoside is Sambucus nigra. Sambucus nigra is the botanical name of the plant which contains l mendelonitrile glucoside where again you can see the L, it's a derivative of l mendelic acid and it is also known as Sambucus green. And here regarding the part of the plant as com uh, which contains this cyanogenic glycoside is the leaves leaves of the plant contain this, this cyanogenic glycoside as compared to the wild cherry we have where we have seen where the bark of the plant contains the cyanogenic glycoside here the leaves are containing the cyanogenic glycoside another example of plant uh, where the cyanogenic glycosides are found in the leaves is prunus laurisiris laurisirisus where it contains both the variety of that is D and L mendelonitrile glucoside which are also known as prolauracin and here also the glycosides are mainly present uh, in the leaves of the plant. Now we come to the most important example of plant uh, that contain cyanogenic glycoside and that has made uh, great news in the world for its toxicity. This is nothing but the cassava plant. This is the structure of cassava plant. And the <coughs> part of the plant which is heavily consumed in the entire world is the root. So this is how the root looks like. Here before consumption, okay, the outer part of the root is peeled off into the and then it is consumed after processing. We will discuss later. So botanical name of cassava is many hot Escolenta and it belongs to the family U4BAC and as I already mentioned the part of the plant used is root regarding the shape of the root it is 5 to 10 centimeter diameter at the top and it is around <coughs> 15 to 30 centimeter in long now this cassava root Products are mainly known in uh, in Spanish and US as yuca, whereas <coughs> the cassava dried powder form it is commonly called as tapioca. This is how the picture of tapioca, the powder form of the root, and most commonly it is known as the gari. Gari is nothing but the fried and granular form of the cassava root. Okay, it is available as flour in the packet in the market. It is also available as uh, cake. So these are the common names of cassava root product. It is yuca, tapioca, and gari. Now, certain important fact about the cassava root. Why is it so important? It is the third largest source of food carbohydrate in tropics that is after mice and uh, there is after rice and maize okay and uh, it is considered as one of the major staple food in the developing world staple food means uh, the people the majority of the energy the maximum energy of the people of developing world those who are consuming cassava root depends on the cassava root that's why it is known as, considered as one of the major staple food for the, the people of those country. And it provides a, uh, uh, providing a basic diet for over a half a billion of people. Okay? And it is most importantly one of the most drought tolerant crop. And that is why also it is very heavily consumed on, on those part of the world which are drought affected. <coughs> because it can be easily cultivated even in drought and Nigeria is considered as the world largest producer of cassava root whereas the Thailand is considered as largest exporter of cassava root and its product root means not in the raw form the root products <coughs> Now, this cassava root uh, peels and uh, leaves 
should not be consumed raw. Why they should not be consumed raw? Because it contains two cyanogenic glycoside, that is linamarine and lotastrolene. This is the structure of linamarine and lotastrolene. If you look at the difference between the two structures, linamarine does not contain the aromatic ring at the glycol part, it contains two methyl group, whereas lotastrolene contains one methyl group and one aromatic ring. And <coughs> this cassava root can be of two variety, that means sweet cassava root and bitter cassava root. Now the taste of the cassava root depends on the amount and or quantity of the cyanogenic glycoside that is present. If the cyanogenic glycoside present is more, the taste of root becomes bitter. And if the presence of cyanogenic glycoside is less, the, pre, uh, the taste of root becomes uh, the sweeter. I would like to tell a story here. Okay, The thinking of the village people, those who are regularly consuming the cassava root. Okay, As you can understand, consuming the bitter variety of cassava root is more dangerous to the health as compared to the sweet variety of fruit because bitter variety contains more cyanogenic glycoside. Now, village uh, village people they think it other way since they don't understand much about the science. Unfortunately, they think the bitter variety is the better variety. The question is why do they think so? But they feel the sweeter variety is more prone to be attacked by bacteria, bacteria, fungus and etc. And they tend to think if the root taste is bitter, it might not be affected by other animals okay, or the bacteria. So they think the bitter variety is more good for the health. Unfortunately, bitter is the bad variety and that's how they consume uh, unknowingly a lot of bitter variety of the roots and uh, suffer from a lot of diseases. What are those diseases? Not only that, many people died even uh, consuming a lot of the bitter and uh, improper quality of the cassava root. Okay, we will discuss one by one. Now let us see the concentration or amount of cyanogenic glycoside that is present in both sweet uh, root and the bitter root. <coughs> So if you see the cyanogenic glycosides are less which is around 20 mg per kg of the fresh root in case of sweet cassava root whereas in case of bitter cassava root it is around 1 gram per kg as compared to 20 mg per kg of the fresh root. So you can see the difference between the presence of cyanogenic glycoside in bitter as compared to the sweet root. So that's the reason whether it is sweet variety or bitter variety, it should not be consumed in raw. Before consuming, it should be processed properly. And the safe processing method is known as wetting method. What is wetting method? Here, the cassava flour is mixed with water into a thick paste. And then let it stand in the shade for at least five hours. So I'd like to mention this five hours it's not a fixed hour. The timing of soaking the cassava root in water and leaving it depends on the variety of fruit, which variety. Say for example, if you take the bitter variety of fruit, you need to keep it for a longer period of time. Similarly, it also depends on the amount of fruit product you are keeping soaking. If the larger the amount, larger the period required for soaking so that you get rid of the cyanogenic glycoside. And in West Africa, the roots are peeled and then put them into water for three days for fermentation. Again, the time is not fixed. It can be three to five days, seven days. And you can understand those village, pe village people who are hunger driven, they don't understand science, neither they have patience to keep it for that long. And then tend to consume it immediately before processing it. And they suffer from various diseases. What are those suffering we will see in the coming slide. So the raw consumption of cassava diet can cause the absorption of linamarine which is uh, one of the uh, most dangerous cyanogenic glycoside and which can cause inhibition of sodium potassium ATPase giving rise to electrolyte imbalance with potassium depletion. Not only that it can also cause cellular swelling and most importantly 
the rupture of epithelial cell, the rupture of epithelial cell of the nephron of kidney, which further results in proteinuria, that means loss of protein. Because of the rupture of epithelial cell, the proximal tubule is not able to filter out the protein and retain it in the blood. So you patient tend to lose a lot of protein. Okay? And also they suffer from low serum albumin concentration. Whereas, talking about the symptoms of acute cyanide intoxication, which happens immediately, it appears almost four or more hours after ingesting raw or improper or poorly processed cassava root, and the symptoms are vertigo, vom vomiting, and collapse, and which may even result in death within just one to two hours of consumption. And in Nigeria, uh, in 18, 19, 18, uh, 1989, uh, eight patients were reported to be dead immediately after consumption of meal of gari. This is one of the incidents. There are many such incidences. Now, talking about the symptoms of uh, chronic uh, low-level cyanide intoxication. Chronic means even though if you are taking the processed food, you know there is a chance that you consume cyanogenic glycoside little little for a little amount for a longer uh, period of time which may give you chronic symptoms and these are the development of goiter tropical ataxic neuropathy okay which gives the symptoms of that is a lessons a lessons of skin mucous membrane and most importantly and the lessons of our injury to optic and auditory nerves spinal cord and peripheral nerves. So you can see it affects your whole nervous system of the body. And in one of the recent incidents, that is in uh, 2010, a lot of people have been uh, reported to be dead in Venezuela when they were suffering from hunger. Uh, there was a time in Venezuela, there was no food. People were even uh, taking food from the street. If you go to the YouTube videos or internet, you will find a lot of information about about the Venezuelan crisis at that time. And at that time, the dozens of people were reported to be dead due to eating bitter cassava in order to calm starvation. Okay. Now, Konzo is one of the most famous disease. Okay, it is an epidemic paralytic disease happened because of the consumption of cassava root okay okay you can see the picture paralytic disease it is occurring mainly among the hunger strike and rural population population in africa due to regular intake of insufficiently processed cassava diet and which results in malnutrition as you know it can cause the rupture of the epithelial cell membrane of the uh, uh, proximal tubule of the nephron okay and here, the legs are more affected as compared to the arms, and the dissimilarity is unfortunately permanent. And this Konzo was first described in 1938 by a doctor known as Giovanni Trolli, based on its observation of eight doctors, okay, that were uh, who, who were working in the Congo area of Belgian Congo, which is now known as uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. So, these are some of the other examples of fruit and its seeds which contain and the cyanogenic glycoside. For example, you can see the lima beans, okay, the bamboo, the apple seeds which contain amygdalene around 900, 690 mg per kg. So, apple seeds contain uh, you know, a huge amount of cyanogenic glycoside. So, even though you pay money for buying the apples, make sure don't eat the apple seeds. These are very toxic to your body. Similarly, the seeds of peach, apricot, palm, you can see they contain huge amount of cyanogenic glycoside. And most importantly, the bitter almond, which contains 4,700 mg per kg. So when you go to the market, buy the best quality almond. Don't buy and eat the cheap bitter almonds, which contain a lot of cyanogenic glycoside. And it is better to soak the almond in water before you consume so that you make sure to get rid of the cyanogenic glycoside. 
Coming to answer question, okay, which of the following types of roots raw consumption can cause inhibition of sodium potassium ATPase and result in proteinuria and low serum albumin concentration? The answer is cassava root. Another question, which of the following a glycon is present in amygdalene? The answer is B, that is mandolinitrile. Last question, which of the following plants in our bark can liberate ACN gas? Remember, instead of the plant name, I have given the botanical name of the plant. It is Prunus serotina. Prunus serotina is the option D. It is the botanical name of wild cherry. And these are some of the references from where I have prepared the entire chapter. Okay, you have seen why you can see, uh, refer this one of the latest reference. It is cyanogenic glycoside containing plant. It is given by Nice in chapter 64 in 2018 from the academic press of Elsevier. There are many other uh, references and one of the good references about the Konzo published in Pediatrics uh, Journal in 2013. So with this, I finish my lecture, I finish the whole chapter of Simon Glycoside here. Thank you for your attention.